This morning we have a really interesting text where we have a great example of how to walk uh, and be more like Christ in our daily lives. And this example comes from Peter and John. And uh, I've been in academia for about almost uh, 30 years now, and I can tell you a good example is critical to get the message across. Uh, you know how it goes. You take the student in the classroom and you explain the basic functionality of something and then you go into the systems and then you talk about how they all work together and they're integrated together. And then you might bring in a checklist and uh, uh, rules of operation. And then finally, uh, you're ready to take them out to actually perform the task. And if you don't give them an example, what I've found is that they freeze up and they just don't understand what it is you want them to do. So what, what I do is I say, okay, we went through the classroom. Now I'm going to show you how I want you to do this. I want you to follow your, with your checklist and see how this works. And then you demonstrate through an example what you want them to do. And usually what happens is you get, oh, that's where that switch is. Or, oh, that, wow, that makes a lot more noise than I expected. Or whatever. And you get a lot of aha moments and it gets real bright in the room. And then they do really well. And then you okay, you saw how I did it, now I want you to do it. And they're a little clunky when they first start, you know, and they're learning how to do it, but that's okay. But they, they try to mimic you, and then as they go through, they start having their own identity, they start making it flow, and then they take ownership, and whammo, you're good to go. So an example is really important. And for us, we can read the scriptures, and we can understand from theology why we should be like Christ, and, of course, we understand the commandments to be like Christ, and we have an emotional desire to be like Christ. But sometimes it's difficult for us to understand how to do that. And that's why I'm thankful for this example today from Peter and John. And so that's what we're going to concentrate on today. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to, uh, again, pray for us uh, and ask God's blessing. Uh, and I'm praying more for myself. And then uh, we'll read the text and we'll get into uh, the sermon. So if you would join me uh, again in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to open your word and to bring your word out. Uh, I recognize the incredible responsibility, and I am feeling the pressure of a holy fear to be accurate with your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be, be with us. I understand who I am. I understand my weaknesses, and I pray, Lord God, that you would uh, speak through me that your name would be glorified in all things and the brethren would be blessed and, uh, you're, and encouraged. In your name I pray, amen. Well, our text this morning is going to be from Acts chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 10. And as is our custom here at Christ Fellowship Church, I'd ask you to stand with me to honor the reading of God's word. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I, do, I ha what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet, fell at his, his feet and his ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So it's a simple story, right? Peter and John were going to go to the temple and pray. They go by this lame guy. They see him. They reach down. They give him a right hand of fellowship, so to speak. He stands up. He's healed. They go in and they... They worship and they praise God. So it's a simple and quick story. And I'm sure those that are here this morning that are hungry would hope that the sermon would go as fast as that did, right? Um, but 
that's one of the things that I find that I, I fall into a trap. I get reading the Bible and I understand what's going on and I kind of put it into my mind's eye and I just kind of skim over it and I speed up and I miss a lot of the spiritual and gracious biblical gems that we have to help us grow to be more like Christ. So today I have three speed bumps uh, to help us slow down in this text to see what God wants us to see out of this. The first one is commitment. The second one is condition. And the third one is uh, consequence. Now, before I do that, I need to go back and review uh, some stuff that happened in Acts chapter 1 and 2, because without that, you're not going to get the full impact of what happens in chapter 3. So we know that Luke wrote Acts. He was writing it as a personal letter to Theophilus, and even though it was a form of a personal letter, we know that he was writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we know that it's God's word and it's inerrant. And he was writing Theophilus because he needed to explain to him how the ministry of the gospel has gone directly from Christ. Now it's getting transitioned and it's going through the church. So it's significant for Theophilus as it is for us to understand how that transition happened. So Luke records how Jesus was with the folks um, and uh, uh, excuse me, at, at the end of uh, the, the gospel, according to Luke, he was explaining how Jesus was with, with the folks and he ascended. So he picks it back up in Acts after Jesus had come back from the dead. Now, you know, saying something like that is kind of casual. Jesus came back from the dead. So you have to think about that for a while. That's one of those phrases that we can say too fast and we need to slow down. But after Jesus had come back from the dead, he could go on anywhere he wanted to. He could have gone in parts of the universe that we don't even understand. Uh, if he did come back to Earth, he could have gone to a Pacific island and just had some R&R, rest and relaxation, and enjoyed uh, some time off. But what he chose to do is he chose to go back to Jerusalem to the very people that they believed in him, but they, they scattered when he was arrested. And they, they were scared, and they didn't know how to handle what was going on. And that has huge implications for us for the church because it demonstrates Christ's relationship to the people in the church. He went back to them. And can you imagine how encouraging that would have been if you kind of faltered on the relationship and then the one you faltered on came back to give you reconciliation? I mean, I think it was awesome. I think there was a lot of hugs. I think that there was a lot of I'm sorry. I think there was a lot of forgiveness. And I think it was just an incredible opportunity. But the Bible tells us that Jesus ate with them and fellowship with them and spoke about the kingdom of God. And you can imagine how incredible that must have been to hear Jesus as he spoke about the kingdom of God. But anyway, as he was speaking with them and talking with them, he gave them two instructions. The first one was the direction of where the church is to go. He said, I want you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, that sounds pretty significant, and it is, but that's what he asked them to do. That's the mission of the church. And then the second thing he said is, I want you all to stick around for a while, because not many days from now, the Holy Spirit's going to get poured out, and I want you to be in Jerusalem together when that happens. And they're like, okay. So they continue to walk with him and talk with him, and you can just imagine how they were just hanging on to every word. It's like, wow, he's alive. He's still with us. He's man, this is an amazing thing. And as they're talking with him, and he's talking with them, and he's listening to them, and he ascended right up into heaven, right before their very eyes. And what a, a, a way to cap off his earthly ministry, right? He had lived a perfect life. He fulfilled God's will perfectly. He was the perfect sacrifice. He died for our sins. He rose from the dead, and now he's sitting at the right hand of God. So that was an amazing event. Well, the folks had some work to do, so they went back to the upper room or wherever it was that they were meeting, and they had a job to do, some administrative work, because there was 12 apostles. But we know one of the apostles uh, killed himself. Judas of Iscariot uh, had um, trade, betrayed Jesus, and he, he felt guilty about that, and he killed himself. So they had to find someone to replace him, so they did. And that brought us to the end of chapter 1. So Luke tells us that there's a lot of religious Jewish folks in Jerusalem at this time from all over the known world. Kind of interesting how Jesus told them that he wanted to take the gospel out to the world. They're probably figuring out how they were going to do that, and here the world came to them. But anyway, um, they were there for the Passover. 
And uh, we learned uh, last time I spoke on this that Pentecost was a celebration of when uh, Moses got the Ten Commandments from God at Mount Sinai. So they were there to, they already had the Passover, so they were getting ready to celebrate Pentecost. And uh, all these folks were in town, and the uh, folks that Jesus had talked to, the believers, were in the upper room. And uh, as they were together, they were praying and probably in the Word and thinking about how they were going to take the Word out to the world. And then they thought, well, Jesus told them to do it do that, but Jesus came back from the dead, so with God, nothing is impossible, and they're probably working this thing through, and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out, and it came out in a huge wind that made this ruckus, and it came into the building, and it looked, it, it looked very strange to them, because it was like these flames that looked like tongues that came down on top of their heads, and when it hit them, they started speaking different languages, and you could just imagine how much co confusion and, and uproar was going on with this. Uh, it had to have been exciting, and you're just like, wow, I can speak Spanish. And they're like, what? <laughs> and the guy next to them was speaking German or whatever it was. that They, you know, they were speaking these different languages. So they, they were coming down after this happened, and the people in town were like, what in the world is going on? And they go up to see where this was happening, and there was this like collision of cultures where all these foreigners were trying to figure out what was going on, and the people were coming down speaking these different languages, and it was an amazing thing because they're like, what, what's happening? And all of a sudden they heard someone speak in their language. And they're like, well, I'll just go to that guy. And he started, well, we were just sitting there. We were doing what God told us to do. We were doing what Jesus commanded us to do. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit poured out and it was like flames. And then we started speaking these languages. And then they launched into the gospel. And at that point, uh, Peter took advantage of this incredible opportunity. And he began to preach. And he brought this awesome sermon uh, to them explaining that this was a total fulfillment of the scriptures that were prophesied back in Joel. And it was, it was just an incredible sermon. And then he went on and talked about what had happened. And he got to the point where he, he says in chapter 2, verse 37, now when they heard this, okay, so he's going through the whole process of the gospel. He says, now when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter, and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And it's an amazing, because the Holy Spirit was not only poured out to the people in the room, but it was poured out to the folks that were hearing this. And they were cut. In 38 it says, and Peter said to them, this is very complicated, so I want to make sure that you hear this very well. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and believe, and you'll be saved. That's it, and you'll be saved. Well, what happened was, whenever you give the gospel, you get two responses. You either get people who repent and believe, or you get people who reject it. And as this was going on, with this incredible amazement, there were people there, religious leaders, who didn't want this to continue. And so they brought in what we know today as a cancel culture. We think that's new, it's not. They've been doing it forever. And so the Jewish leadership had to... Uh, uh, smear their character and say, oh, they're a bunch of drunks. Uh, no one talks like that. That's ridiculous. I mean, they got a whole town of foreigners and they say don't, they don't talk like that. So they're, they're drunks. Are you going to really take theological understanding from a drunk? They're not self-controlled. They're the dregs of society. Oh, come on, man. This is crazy. Well, something happened right after that. And Peter stood with the brethren and we have to understand how this works, because when Peter stood, if you remember last week, Jay talked about how Peter denied Christ. And when Peter denied Christ, something really powerful happened. Um, with Peter, when, when, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said he wouldn't deny Christ. Peter, or Christ got arrested. He was in, when the, the men uh, were beating him up and putting the crown of thorns on his head and torturing him. Peter was uh, in the uh, uh, patio area and uh, warming himself by the fire. And a servant girl came up and she said, um, aren't you with him? He's like, no, I'm, I'm not with him. I mean, he was threatened by a servant girl. That's kind of strange. But um, this happened two other times for a total of three times that Peter denied Jesus Christ. And as we know, the rooster crowed and it triggered in his mind and he looked up and uh, he had eye contact with Christ. 
And like I said, he was fine. He was scared, but he was fine. But then he looks at Christ, who had blood coming down from his, his head, from this crown of thorns. He had been beaten up. He was probably physically hurting. And then when he had eye contact with Peter, he was, he was very disappointed. And Peter ran out, and he wept. But, like we learn, when Christ came back, they had reconciliation. And Jesus had a very powerful reconciliation with Peter, and I'm sure it was difficult for him to go through, but he gained such confidence in Christ's forgiveness that he was able to stand with the brethren, and he was able to speak to these people that were saying that these are a bunch of drunks, and that's how he was able to launch into this incredible sermon, that he was able to bring the gospel. The people repented and believed, and Luke recorded that there was about 3,000 added to the church that day. That is incredibly huge. Can you imagine if it was us? With it, we went out and we, we presented the gospel, and then all of a sudden there were 3,000 people that were added to our church right here, right now. I mean, I know we got a lot of goofy rooms in this building. We might be able to fill up some of them, but you know, where would we park? Would we park in the soccer mom parking lot across the street? I'm kidding. Don't do that. But you know, it's like you can imagine the logistics of involved with all of these people all of a sudden coming into the church. It was an amazing thing. Well, not only did they come into the church, not only did they repent and believe, but they were changed because where they had seen each other in the streets walking around, now they cared for the brethren. They were brothers and sisters in the Lord. And where one had a problem, they might sell some of their items so that they could get money and help each other out. They fellowshiped with each other. They worshiped with each other. They prayed with each other. And it was an amazing event that was going on. And that's what takes us up to chapter 3 and our first point of commitment. So we see that in the first chapter, in chapter 3, and it says, now. Now. Now, There's several ways that we can read that word now. It could be read, you know, we got all these people that are added to the church. We got to have the right theology. We, We have to have, we have needs of people. We have people that are selling things. We got to make sure that the money gets to the right spot. Where, you know, where are we going to park all the camels? You know, and they're on and on about how all of this is going on. Now you want to go to the temple and pray? Really? Do you think this is the best time to do that? We have a lot going on here. You could read it that way. You could. You could read it now. Now God gave me a responsibility, and I'm in charge of all of this. And now we have a lot of people that are coming to the church. There's a lot that we have to do. We have a lot of uh, help them. They're coming from a different religion, so we need to have theology to make sure that they understand. There's a lot of logistics that we got to work through. And now's not really the right time for us to, uh, you know, go to prayer. So we're, God will understand if I put this off because I have a lot going on in my life right now. And if I leave, it's probably all going to stop. So we'll just go ahead and put the prayer in another time. And now we'll just stay here and do this. You could read it like that, but that's not how Luke wrote it. And that's not what it says. And that's not what happened. Peter and John were showing the commitment that they had to their Lord and Savior, because it says now Peter and John were going up to the temple at that hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Even with all of this going on, they could have made all the excuses in the world, but they chose to make the commitment and follow through with that to, to go to prayer. And they didn't get that out of a vacuum. You can just look at Jesus Christ and his whole entire life on this planet to see where they got that from. But I'm just going to use the example of Gethsemane. Jesus could have, he knew exactly what was going to happen, and and he could have very easily have said, you know, I got these folks that are going to come, and they're going to arrest me, and they're going to take me and beat me up and everything like that, so we're going to, we're going to fortify our positions, and, and, you know, I want you to stand over here, and I want you to fight over here, and I want you to do this. I don't really have time right now to pray, because that would take away from, I I got this urgent thing going on, because these folks are coming, and we need to do battle, and we need to win the victory. That's not what happened. That's not what he said, and that's not what he did. What he did is he proved his commitment to his Lord, his Father, God the Father, and he prayed. And he prayed with such unction that it was like uh, drops of blood coming out of him. And even the apostles didn't get it. They were falling asleep. They couldn't catch what was going on. And he would come to them. It's like, "I, I need you to pray with me. Don't you understand? And so Jesus 
proved and showed and lived this commitment to God's plan for his life, God's will, and he, he wanted to obey God's will, and he wanted to love God and honor him, and he was committed to him, and now, now is the time to pray. And, you know, you might think about that, and it's like, well, that's a great biblical story, but, but what? Maybe God is putting events in your life to help you come to prayer. Maybe that's what you need in, to do. And God's saying, I keep throwing this stuff at you because I want you to come to me in prayer, and you keep putting it off, using it as an excuse. And I, I'd like to just take a, a, a little side note to this. You know, there's some horrific things that happen to folks in our country not uh, many days uh, with the, the storms and the tornadoes, and it just breaks my heart. And it, and it used to be whenever you would have a natural disaster or some kind of uh, event, uh, maybe a terrorist or event or some kind of uh, criminal activity, that some uh, person of authority would get in front of the microphones and they would say something like, uh, well, we need to uh, ha ha you know, keep these folks in your thoughts and prayers, the, the families uh, of the victims, we need to pray for them, or this community, we need to pray for them. And then not too recently uh, in the past, you heard people say, you know what, enough of that prayer thing. You know, we, we actually got to do something. We, we don't have to do this hocus pocus stuff, prayer. We don't have time for that. We, we actually have to go and actually do something. Well... For those that are Christians, I'm going to tell you right now that you are doing something. You are praying to a sovereign God. And don't let anybody take that away from you. If you notice in the, in the news, they're, they're like, yeah, this happened. And they don't even mention it because the cancel culture took that away. Don't let anybody take that away. You are praying to a sovereign God. And you are doing something. And you need to show your commitment through prayer of what it is that you believe in. But we also, under the, the point of commitment, we have an example. Like I said before, Jesus' whole entire life is an example. Of everything that we should do, we should follow him. Um, and, and we would be good to do that. But how do we show the commitment that we have in Christ? Well, I would say that us as elders here at Christ Fellowship Church, we need to be committed to how Christ is and let our lives be transparent to demonstrate our commitment to Christ because Peter and John were willing to make a commitment and show what, that, what you're supposed to do when all of these people just showed up to the church. They're all new. They don't even know where to sit. They don't even know what's going on. They know that they believe. They know they repented, and they know that they are saved. But what do we do? Well, there's a lot going on. Sure, it's a busy time. Absolutely. It's a glorious time. Now, Let's go pray. And they were willing to be an example to these new believers. And we need to be an example to you guys. And um, I fall short of that. Uh, I'm thankful that we have forgiveness of sin and assurance of pardon. But I need to work on that all the time. But not only do the elders need to be an example for our, our church family, but you, if you're a Christian, you need to be an example of your commitment of Christ. You need to be a witness of what Christ has done for you. How do you show your commitment to your family or your workmates? Um, and how you do that is, Jesus told us, really simple. Let your light shine. Who, who lights a light and puts a bushel over it? Who lights a light just to turn it off? Be a light. Show your commitment uh, of your faith in Jesus Christ to the people that you are around. Um, the other aspect of commitment that we have in this point is that Peter... It says that Peter and John were going up to the temple. And that's a huge point in my mind because they're showing a commitment to each other. And when I was reviewing uh, chapter 1, it says that Jesus came back to the believers. And I think that that is huge because he's showing his commitment to them. Not only does, do they have a relationship with Christ, he has a relationship to them. And I believe that we have a commitment to each other. And we see that when the people were saved, they changed their, their whole will. Their will wasn't me, 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 and I'm just going to do my own thing. They saw the needs of their brethren, and they acted on those needs, and they sacrificed to take care of each other. And we have a church family here. We're in the Christ Fellowship Church family, and we need to be committed to each other and love each other and help one another. And, uh, you know, a lot of times... 
um, Cindy and I were used to this when we were in the military. You know, sometimes we would go to a church and they're like, well, we're really happy that you're here, but they would hold a distance because we would, they knew we would be gone in a couple years. And, and, you know, that's a very reasonable thing to think. But what I would like to encourage you is different. I would like you to, to be committed to us, and I would like us to be committed to you and just gobble up the time that we have together and thank God for it. It's a blessing. And, and that's the way that we should be with our military breath, uh, families that come to, to join our church. I, don't, I, I mean, I could write my congressman and ask him not to have you go anywhere, but I don't think that would work. But uh, we just need to be committed to each other as a family. So the first speed bump that we hit was commitment, and we saw it with the word now. They were uh, committed in prayer, they were committed to be an example, and they were committed to each other. And, you know, when, when we uh, are going to be attacked, which we will be attacked in the church, it's a whole lot easier to stand together than it is by yourself. You do have to stand by yourself, of course, but it's a lot easier to stand together. Like Peter showed, he stood with the brethren, and then he preached. But then we have a second speed bump. It's called condition. And we see that where Luke is talking about the guy that was lame, and his feet were not working right. But what I would like you to do is I'd like you to look at it a little differently. I'd like to start out with Peter and John. And I'm looking at uh, verse 4. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give you. And, you know, when I read that, I think about the fact that I think, I don't know what kind of clothes they had, but I think about pockets where you pull out your pockets. You're like, I don't have, I don't have anything, you know, I... I, I have no money, and uh, it kind of like, um, you know, Luke says that the guy was lame. He was probably thinking that was lame. They don't have any money. But the point is, is that our condition is, is that we are equipped. If you're a Christian, you are equipped with everything that you need to give the gospel. That's your condition. You have everything that you need if you're a Christian. Note that I didn't qualify that. I didn't say, if you've been a Christian for five years, or if you have some kind of theological training, or whatever. If you are a Christian, if you repented and you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are equipped right now. Your condition is set that you can give the gospel to anybody. And Jesus shows us that when uh, in Luke 8, he was coming across in a boat, and he came up to the shore, and there was a guy that was uh, uh, infected by these demons. He had a legion of demons in him, and he was just uh, a very scary sight to see. And uh, the apostles went away to get some food, and Jesus healed the guy from this uh, demonic possession. And they came back, and they saw him sitting in his right mind talking with Jesus. Now, can you imagine being able to just sit next to Jesus and talk to him at the second that he saved you, that, that is an amazing thing. And we can in prayer, but I'm talking about in, in person. And this man was just talking to Jesus, and Jesus was talking to him, and they came back, and they were getting ready to leave. And here's the point. They were getting ready to leave, and the guy's like, I want to go with you. I want You saved me. You took care of me. You healed me. You took those demons out of me. I, I want to just be with you forever. And Jesus said, I don't know if he put his arm around him, if he put his arms on his shoulders. I don't know how that worked out, but I just can imagine in a very loving way, Jesus said, no, I want you to go back to your town and tell them what I did for you. How long was that guy saved? Right? He just got saved, and he was equipped. His condition was he was able to give the gospel, and that's what Christ asked him to do. That's what Christ told him to do, and what did he do? He obeyed. He went back. So if you're a Christian today, right now, no qualification, you are equipped to give the gospel. But we also see a condition that we need to have compassion. Now, a lot of times when we see people who are um, uh, begging, we, we, we can have a thought, right? You know, if you go up to Oklahoma City, uh, every beggar has their own corner. They have it all down. Some people have dogs with them, and you're like, right. But when Peter and John were going into the temple, they knew this guy was going to be there. He was there daily. They brought him there daily. 
they knew he was going to be there. Did they just kind of gloss over it? Then they're like, oh, look, a giraffe. And they go around the side. You know, no, they didn't do that. They went up to the guy and they confronted him and they, they had uh, compassion on him. And, and we get that from Jesus in Luke 17. Jesus had a task. He was going from one town to another town. And as he was going, he passed by these 10 lepers. He's, they're, they're, they know who he is and they call out. Heal us. Take care of us. We, 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 we can't do it ourselves. We need you to take care of us. And Jesus had compassion on them, and he told them what to do. And as soon as they stepped out in obedience, they were healed. And they all ran back into town. And you can imagine why they would be excited to do that. They just got healed. They want to see their family. They want to get back into their society. But one turned around, and he came back, and he thanked Jesus for saving him, or for healing him, for taking care of him. And the point that I'm saying is uh, our, our compassion shouldn't be respective on the response that we get. We need to be compassionate. Someone's going to take advantage of us, yeah. We need to be wise. We need to be careful. We need to be smart. But we need to have compassion. And that's the condition that we should always be walking in. We should be looking at people through the vision of Christ. But last, we're looking at the condition of the lame man. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time here because <clears throat> he's very interesting to me. He was born lame, and he never knew the difference. He, he felt normal because he's always been that way. But as he grew up in life, he realized that he wasn't normal. But he felt normal, but he wasn't normal. See, there's a conflict there. There's a frustration there. It's like all my friends grew up and they can walk. How come I can't walk? And, and, but he felt normal because he never felt anything different. He always was the same. Um, and so there was this frustration here that he didn't understand how it was that he was going to be healed. So maybe he tried to heal, put ointments on his legs or exercises or put braces on his legs. But there's nothing that he could do inside of himself to make him whole. But... He, he, he knew that he wasn't whole. And his friends would take him to the temple every day and, and have him beg for money because he couldn't do anything else. So the realization is that he, he, even though he felt normal, he wasn't able to walk and he needed to beg for money. And he had a problem. And it's interesting that Peter said, um, he, he's, he has him looking right at Peter and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand. And what's interesting about that process is when Peter talked to the lame man, he made it clear you had to look to Christ to be saved. You have to look to Christ. You, have, you can't save yourself. There's nothing that you can do inside of yourself to save you. You have to look at Christ. And he went out. And he answered the effectual call, and he stepped out in faith. He took his hand. And when he took his hand, he rose up, and he was instantly able to walk. He didn't have to go through physical therapy. He didn't have to go through all kinds of activities to learn how to walk. It says that he, he was raised up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. He didn't have to learn how to walk. He was immediately saved. He was immediately healed. Think about that in a, in a form of being a Christian, and you or a sinner, and you repent and you believe, you're immediately justified before the throne of God. So the point is, is that he had to look to Christ. And, you know, Peter probably had a really sensitive feeling about that because who else would know about looking to Christ than Peter? You know, when he was in the boat and Jesus was walking on the water, and he says, if you command me to come out, I'll come out. And Jesus said, come on. And he was looking at Jesus, and he was walking on the water, and he's like, woohoo! And then all of a sudden he realized that there's a storm going on, there's waves going around, and he took his eyes off of Christ, and he began to stink, and he panicked. And Christ picked him up and saved him. So Peter, if all people would know, look to Christ, and he will save you. So our, con our, our condition is that we're equipped to give the gospel. We need to have compassion. We have, the, we have Christ in our heart. We need to look at people with that, that compassion. But when we talk about the people who are lame, we, uh, we need to understand that, that you can't save yourself. You have to look to Christ. And, and you can imagine that this guy being lame and his frustration, I mean, 
we see it today, right? The, the, let's say that the lame guy is sitting there and he's all frustrated. His friends carry him back and forth in some kind of blanket so that they can carry him. And uh, he's like, you know what? I'm going to change the definition of walk. I'm going to change the definition. Walk now means that you're carried by four of your friends to and fro, and now I'm walking. So they come back out after a full day of begging. They pick him up. And they're walking him home, and he's yelling out from this blanket, I'm walking, I'm walking, right? You can almost hear President Biden, come on, man. You know you're not walking. You know you're, you're lame. They're carrying you, you know? So you know for a fact that when you start to change the definitions, it doesn't change the status of what's going on. He's lame. He had to look to Christ, and he stepped out in faith, and Christ healed him. So now we come to our third speed bump. We've had commitment, condition, and now we have consequence. And the consequence, we see it right here. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk. And where did he walk? Where did he go? Did he go home to tell his mom? Did he go to the people that were teasing him and bullying him because he was a lame guy? Did he, did he go try to prove how strong he was? No, it says, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. He, his, the consequence was he went into the church. And what I'd like to do is I would like for the Christians to understand that your consequence of putting your faith in Jesus Christ is you're secure. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. Nothing will take you out of his hand. We are in the family of God. We have the hope of a new heaven and a new earth. We, we, we of all people should have joy that never gets quenched. And, you know, I'm not trying to be Pollyanna here. I understand that there's real things that happen in life, but I also understand that the security and the joy that we have in our salvation will, will, will never take that away. Nothing, will, nothing can take away the joy that we have in our salvation. Just like this guy, he was leaping, and, and you know that his response to being healed had to pull, you know, go over onto John and Peter, and they were happy too. They were happy for him. But... The security that we have is not only in and of ourselves and our personal relationship with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, but it's with, we have a church family. And that's what we have here at Christ Fellowship Church or wherever church you are. We have the universal church, but we have a local church. And we, we have the opportunity that we can worship together and we can be committed to each other. And we have a church family. And you don't have that. Now, let me say that I'm thankful for the opportunity that this can go uh, and be streamed on Facebook. And there's people that are ill that have to be uh, at home, and I'm thankful that they have a chance to watch this on, on their phone or however they watch it. But the fact is, is that when you're here in church, there's nothing that matches that. We have uh, a family together. And we, when we're together and we worship together and we uh, weep with those that weep and we rejoice with those that rejoice and we are walking and helping each other in our sanctification, that is an amazing thing. And the worldlings don't have that. They try to have it, but they don't have it. And this is what is so important about our church family and the consequence of being saved. So we need to be committed to our church. But finally, I'd like to look at the, those that aren't saved. What's your consequence? What's going on with you? So like the guy that was born lame, I understand where you're coming from. Because, see, I was born just like you under the curse. And I didn't feel any different. People would come up to me and say, you need to have a new heart. You have a heart of stone. You need to have a heart of flesh. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I can run circles around you. And, and someone could say that to me. And I would be like, yeah, you could, you could probably run circles around me. Because they don't feel any different. They were born under the curse. So when we're telling them you're, you're, you have a problem, there's going to be, there's gonna be a, an, an issue. Because... They were also born in image, or they were made in the image of God, and they have a conscience, and they suppress the truth. And the truth is that we know what's, what we know what's right and wrong. You know that murder and abortion is wrong. You know that. You know that. You know that there's only two genders, male and female. You know that. It's clear. So just as crazy it would be for a guy to say that he's walking just because he changed the definition, that's ridiculous. You are under a curse. And the curse results that if you, if and when you die, uh, you're going to go in front of the judgment of God. 
And when you stand in front of the judgment of God, you're going to say, hey, I wasn't that bad. I mean, you know, and you are that bad. You are going to be found lacking and you are going to be condemned forever in hell. There is there is nothing that you can do to save yourself. Just like the lame man, there's nothing that he could do to make his feet work. He had to reach out of himself in faith to Christ. And if you're here today and you're not a Christian, you must understand you are born under the curse and you are doomed to an eternal uh, damnation if you do not repent and believe. And you need to look to Christ. You need to answer the effectual call and look to Christ to be saved. Well, that's uh, our passage today. And we saw three main points to help us uh, grow in being more like Christ in our daily walk. We looked at commitment. You know, the commitment to uh, prayer, to be an example wherever we are. Maybe you're at home and you don't live right at home. Maybe you say something you shouldn't say, or you, your temper take, gets the better of you, or you fail. That can be an example in how to repent and ask God to forgive you and show that to your family. You can do that at, at work. But we need to be committed to being an example to others about what we believe in. And then we need to be committed to each other. You know, it's like... Uh, uh, I enjoy uh, welcoming you all whenever I have to stand at the door and uh, bring, uh, be a host, if you will, when you come into church. I enjoy it because our church family is coming together. You know, when you think about this time of the year, you see families that are getting together and you're all excited to see your cousins, your aunts, or uh, whatever, and uh, you know, you're excited to see them. Well, that's how I feel here, and that's how we should all feel, and I know that we do. But we need to be committed to each other, help one another. And we need to be committed to those new believers. You know, when someone comes into the church and they repent and they believe, we need to be committed to their well-being. We need to, we need to surround them and help them. Our condition, our condition is that we're equipped. We might not have money. We, not, we might not be a CEO, might not be a manager. You know, I'm just a working stiff. I just, I work nine to five or whatever it is. Uh, but we are all, if you're a Christian, we are all equipped right now to give the gospel. And our condition should be that we have compassion. And not only should we help people who have real needs, uh, like they, you know, they're begging or whatever, but we need to have compassion to give them the gospel. We need to let our light shine and direct them to look to Christ and be saved. And the consequence, well, we should have joy. And there's a lot of things that are very difficult to be joyous about. You know, you got this COVID thing, you got politicians that are abusing it, you got the weather, you got all kinds of uh, threats over in Russia and China and Iran. There's a lot of things that could attack your ability to have joy. And we need to understand that we have security in Jesus Christ. And nothing will separate us from the love of God. And we need to have a joy that stands the test of time. And we have that in Christ. We have a church family. And our, our, our consequence is that we are adopted into a family. And that is a wonderful thing. And then for those who aren't saved, well, I'm just going to say it again. God is a perfect and just God. And he has a requirement. And he has the requirement is that you're holy and just. And in, you are born under a curse. And there's no way, no one is righteous. No, not one. There's no way you in and of yourself can meet the requirement that God has. And if a tornado comes through, oh, a tornado's never going to come through. Okay, just call the folks in Tennessee and ask them. If a tornado comes through, you're working in your candle factory, and all of a sudden your buddies get d killed. I don't know. I had a friend a couple weeks ago just died of a stroke, and he's younger than I am. You know, you, when you stand before the judgment seat of God and you're not a Christian, you are doomed to eternal damnation. But if you look to Christ, you repent and believe, just like Peter said, repent and believe, right? You will be saved. And I would ask, I would plead with you this morning, 
that you would do that, that you would answer the effectual call, that you'll reach out in faith, repent and believe, and rise to walk in the newness of life. Well, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to come this morning. I thank you for the opportunity that uh, you've given me to bring your word. I praise you, Lord God, for these, these points that you help us to see from your word. I pray that you would help us to be more and more committed as you love us and you take care of us, that that commitment would just grow stronger and stronger. I pray, Lord, that uh, our condition of joy would help us to spread the word, that you would help us to let your light shine. And I pray, Lord God, that you would save many people today, that they would repent and believe that your name would be glorified. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.